the Satisfied God podcast. Raven Bird uh, here with you once again. Thanks for listening and thanks for downloading. Appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm going to make this very quick. This episode will be on the same theme and subject as the last episode, but this uh, particular one was done on a Sunday during one of our Sunday morning services and some things came out differently. Uh, there was an emphasis that was different. Uh, a couple of other uh, things that were not said in the previous session were addressed in this session. And so I wanted to share it with you on the podcast, uh, for those of you who may not have listened to the Sunday session, uh, because I think those particular things that are added and uh, the you know, parts that are uh, emphasized in, in a slightly different way may help and may uh, be beneficial to you in, in understanding these things. We were talking, of course, about the guarantee, God being, not, not giving, but being the pledge for the good. And this, of course, comes from Psalms 119 and the prayer uh, that the psalmist writes, desiring for God to be his pledge, meaning sure, the surety, the certainty that the good that God had promised in the law, under the commandments, under that age, under that testimony, would be his. But he knew that he was not the one who had the power or the sufficiency in himself to validate it or to guarantee it. None of his works could guarantee it. None of his efforts could guarantee it. He threw himself upon the mercy of God that God would be the guarantee, the guaranteeing and certifying and sure, assuring power to, to ensure that that good thing would come to him and be his portion as God had promised. And what my point in this is to say, his prayer has been answered. And if we are born of the spirit of God, the guarantee himself abides in our hearts. The certainty of it all is resident in our heart, resident in our soul. He is the guarantee of the good. He is the good itself. His presence alone sufficiently handles and answers that prayer. So that's what we're dealing with in this particular episode. And I appreciate you guys listening to it. Thank you for all that you're doing to encourage me and to help. Um, I hope these things are mutually an encouragement to you. Love you very much. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning. Um, what I want to do is just share, I hate to, you know, break into things kind of in the middle of things, but I've been looking at Psalms 119 for some time. Uh, with uh, some folks and we're pretty deep into the to the lessons but recently we were in uh, verses 120 to 125 and there's a portion of that I want to talk to you about this morning and that's in verse 122 and 123 and just uh, look at that for a moment we've been talking a lot about this psalm being a forward-looking psalm, a prophetic psalm in that it looked beyond the moment in time where this one who is writing was under the law, loving the law with all of his heart, desiring to do and to keep the commandments of God, yet simultaneously understanding that all attempts on his part to keep the law fell short that he could not do it in himself. 
there is no possibility with man. When faced with the perfection of the law's righteous requirements. And in the Psalms I want to read to you today, I want to look at another area. Because we've been talking about his cry for life. Give me your life that I may keep your law. Cause me to live that I may keep your commandments forever and forever. Understanding again the divine work that was necessary for God to give him something. Give him his own life. God's life. That the law being kept would be something that would never not be so. Meaning, it was never a moment when, when that life comes, there's never a moment where the law is not fulfilled, where the law is not kept. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because most Christians still live in that battle. Most Christians still live in the struggle of keeping the law, trying to be what the law, what God wants, trying to be perfect, trying to be holy, trying to be righteous. And the fact is the psalmist here doesn't cry out, God, let me be, help me be. The psalmist says, God, you be for me. And so let's turn to the Psalms again, Psalms 119. Verse 122 and 123. Give your servant, speaking of himself, again a prayer. Give your servant a pledge of good. And let not the insolent or proud oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation. Now this is from the English Standard Version. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. I want to talk about this pledge of good. First, let's just simply define the word pledge here. It's a word that means, of course, to pledge, to be or become a surety. To go for surety or to guarantee one standing. Notice now, in the light of this definition, in the light of the verse, the light of what we've said in Psalms 119, he is asking for a pledge of the good or of good. Again, a man under the law understanding simultaneously while loving the law, doing the law, his inability up against the law, his impotence as to be what the law desires, to fulfill it in himself, to be that holy, to be that perfect. Again, the same struggle most Christians live under. That's why we are convinced that Romans 7, which we'll look at in a little bit, Romans 7 is still the obligatory struggle of every Christian. We think that we should live a life that is saying, every time I try to do good, evil is there. Every time I try this, I fail. It's the struggle of it. We think that's Christianity. We think that's living for Jesus. But the the pledge of good that he is calling for is not, God help me be something. It is God you be. For me, something I cannot be. And you notice this is the pledge of good or for good. This is not just, you know, pledging a promise or a guarantee of anything, you know, insignificant. He's not talking about something flippant here. He's talking about the good, what the law actually promises. That's why we read the next verse. I long for your salvation, even the fulfillment of your righteous promise. But he's asking God to step in and to be for him the surety, the guarantee of the good. That means be for me the guarantee that the good that you promise will actually come to me and be my possession. Because I know if left up to me, if it is, 
If I am the guarantee, and this is the part I want us to understand, this is the part that's so simple, yet is the stumbling stone of most. If we are the thing that guarantees this, then there is never a guarantee. If we are the one that makes it sure, there's never stability in our Christianity. There's never stability in a relationship. It's always a concern of where you stand and how you can make it better. What did you do to make it less or how can you make it more? And there's always that struggle. And we're always assessing the situation, assessing ourselves. We're always attempting to make it secure or praying for God to make it secure by some means or help us to do it. I was recently looking at um, the uh, event. It's in the Gospels where Jesus and the disciples get into the boat together. And he says, let us go to the other side. And as they're on the water, a storm comes up and the beat's on the boat and the boat's filling up with water. And it says Jesus is in the stern of the boat, sleep on a pillow. And the rest of them are like, where's he at? Does he not know we're dead? We're dying here. What's wrong? We're not safe. We're about to perish. And Jesus isn't bothered by it. He's at rest. Now, most people would present this and say, see, you need to be like Jesus and rest in the midst of your storm. That was not the point. The point is Jesus was at rest. Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they come to him saying, we're surely going to perish. Do you not care? And he gets up out of his sleep and he rebukes the storm, says, peace be still. And he rebukes them and says, you people with little faith, why are you so fearful? Now, I understand the messianic point of this. This has got to be the Son of God. The seas and the waves and all the nature obey His voice. But what did they have to do? What was the thing? His, this is the thing that hit me in it. And I know, again, that this doesn't give the full picture. Their security in the midst of it all, the thing that made them safe, was not the ceasing of the storm. The thing that made them safe and made them secure and made their condition certain as far as you're good was the fact that Jesus was asleep and at rest. But they thought they had to awaken him and get him to fix their situation because they saw something that was familiar to them. It said trouble, danger. But he wasn't disturbed by it at all. And that was their certainty, that he wasn't disturbed by it. He was still at rest. And yet they felt the need to wake him out of his rest so that he could make their state seem to be safe because their understanding of safety means there's no storm. Nothing's beating on this boat. His rest was their security. Him being at rest, him being asleep in the boat, was their security in the boat. And that, to me, points here. What is our certainty? What is our security in Christ? Is it that the the visibility of the thing that I look at to destroy to assure myself that everything's good, is there? Or is it the fact that Christ is in me 
and lives in me as the certainty of it all. That the guaranteeing power of my salvation is the fact that he is present and that God has said it is done. Most don't see it that way because we, again, want the externals and the natural to be congruent with what we're told the internal is. So we've got to have both of those things in order. Well, guess what? Nope. Not always. And if I was to say, not ever. Because the internal is much greater than the external can ever demonstrate. If we can understand that. Because the external thing that we point to and say, that's good, that's holy, that's righteous, that's no problem. Doesn't even measure up to the internal righteous, holy, perfect, sure. And when you're looking to that to define this, then you are still not seeing the reality. And that's why we're always at odds and always trying. And that's what we pray for. God Help this match this. Help all of this come into line. (laughs) So I can feel sure. And the whole time he's there as the surety of it all. As the certainty of everything. But when we're talking about an internal condition, a man under the law here in Psalms, we're looking at a man who is... Asking for God to be the surety for the good. And this brings a definitive clarity to the concept of good. Especially regarding the good which the law was a shadow of. And that's what we're talking about here. I have here the the tablets of stone. I'm not an artist. We all know. Uh, Scriptures say that the law, the commandments was a shadow of the good thing that was to come. Meaning it, as a shadow does, it is something that shows a form because a substance has, is standing there to cast that shadow, like a body, cast a shadow. The shadow's not the body, But unless there is a body, there could be no shadow. Unless there's a substance, there would never be a shadow. And that's what the law was. The law was a shadow that pointed to the body that cast that shadow. There was a substance always, eternally. The word, the beginning and the end, the good. And this is what we'll talk about today in both directions. The pledge. A man under the law could say to God, I need a guarantee. You remember what the promise that God made to Abraham? God told him about the seed and what would happen as far as the land and everything. Made that promise to him. And and, and what was Abraham's question? What was Abraham's question? Discussion with God. It was, how do I know of a surety that this is so? How can, I, how can I know that this is true and certain and sure, what you're telling me? What did God do? He said, well, uh, I tell you what. I'll let you, I'll give you the power to get all of this done. That's not what God said. What was the guarantee? What was the thing that made it sure? He put Abraham over here to the side, and Abraham saw God cut a covenant with himself. And that covenant was the certainty of all the promises of the covenant made with Abraham. The covenant cut was not with Abraham. Abraham had no part of it. He had no part of making it sure. He didn't walk hand in hand with God through the pieces of the animals. God did it himself. It was all God. That's the pledge. That's the certainty of this. That's the guarantee. What does that mean? That the law itself 
even when an earthen vessel is doing his best, trying and trying and trying to do what it says. The law did have a certainty to it. It had a pledge behind it. It had a guarantee behind it as to its fulfillment, as to the coming of the substance it prophesied of. And guess what? The earthen vessel wasn't it. The earthen vessel was not the thing that guaranteed it. The soul that God was dealing with under the law was not the thing to guarantee any of it. So this man saying, God, I need guarantee, be, not just guarantee that I can do this. That's the, that's the horrible definition most people present today as grace. God's empowerment for us to live for him. That's grace. No. Grace is... God living in us as the life of the soul. Living in us as the righteousness that the law demanded but could not provide. Living in us as holiness in its most perfect form. That spirit and truth. Not a flesh, not a man of the flesh or an earthen vessel demonstrating through his actions or works or attitudes or words. Perfect life. Perfect living. No. No. It's about a life that is way beyond this being now brought into the soul, living into the, in the soul, and not now just guaranteeing eternally the, the fulfillment, but living internally as the fulfillment, as the guaranteeing power of it all. So that we could say as Paul what guarantees this all for me, a man that once lived under the law, once tried to be everything that the, the, I thought the law was demanding me to be, the life that I now live is not I but Christ. That guarantees it. That's the sureness of it. That makes it as certain as it ever will be. So he's telling God in this prayer, I want you to be the guarantee for you to be the surety of the good, that it will finally be my portion and my possession. And this is so vital to the whole of the psalm. And as we've covered before, if it's vital to this psalm, it's vital to the whole of the testimony. This is basically the cry of the whole testimony. And that's why Jesus would say, they are they that testify of me. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Why? Because it's the me who was the surety of it all before it was. He was the surety of the thing before the thing existed. That's why he is the beginning and the ending. He is the origination of it and the culmination of it. So when this psalmist is crying out, and that's why the next verse is so important, God, you be the pledge for the good for me. So man is not saying, God, make me strong enough to do this. Make me perfect in my daily living. Make me holy. Make me righteous. It's a man crying out, God, you be that. You be the pledge. You be the certainty of this. Because the law and the commandments, all those speaking toward the good thing, could never make the good thing an apprehended internal reality. The law and the testimony could not produce the end or the good that it exemplified. And while man's most flawless execution exposed their own impotence up against perfection, God himself stood in eternity as the surety of it. As the surety of everything the law demanded, as the surety of the perfect righteousness the law demanded, commanded, and promised. And that is why Paul would write and could write in Romans 7, the law is spiritual. I am carnal. Why? Because the law had a spiritual source. It had a spiritual 
substance of which it spoke. And it had a spiritual fulfillment. And they're one and the same. The pledge from the very beginning is now the internal pledge who has come into my soul. There's no difference. The body that cast the shadow, the shadow called the law, the testimony, this body, the word himself, the beginning and the end, the good thing, this body, the person of Christ, was the pledge, was the guarantee that this would be fulfilled was the pledge that this was not just something that God looked at man and said, I know you can't do it, but tough. Men who look at themselves to try to be this think that's the God of the old covenant. The God that demanded from men. No, because there was already a guarantee that this would be fulfilled. But again, the guarantee was Christ himself, not the earthen vessel, not man. Man was never the guarantee of it. Man would never be the thing that made it certain. Because God already had the reality before he had the shadow. That is why faith receives the substance Faith receives the guarantee instead of trying to be like it or imitate it. That's what we're taught. So that he could write the law of spiritual, I'm carnal. The law constantly bombarded mankind who were under the headship of Adam with condemnation. But the law did not, man, the law never depended upon man's carnality for its fulfillment. It looked to. It looked to, and it was assured by already the person of its spiritual origination. Now, The thing that we see in Psalms 119 is is the fact that while the love for the law was intact, undeniable in every word that this man writes, the understanding of his own inability was always before him. Constantly the knowledge that produces the cry over and over in this psalm, give me life, cause me to live, that I may keep your word that I may keep your commandments. But I love the fact that in this psalm, he's not saying, make this sure for me. He's saying, be the surety of it for me. Be the thing that guarantees this for me. I wish every believer would understand that was the cry of the old covenant. That is the reality of the new. Because This soul, this vessel, under this law was crying out for something to guarantee it for him. Because Romans 7, we're going to read that right now. Romans 7 shows you this struggle. The psalmist understood the great need of another party, another power, a divine author and finisher to stand as, the all, as his own surety for the good. He wasn't depending on his own power, his own strength, his own abilities. That was not this man's heart. This man's heart was, I understand, I can't. But I know you are. Be for me. Stand for me as my guarantee. Be my surety. Be the certifying certainty of my soul. Because if it all depends on me, here's here's what I find. Romans 7, verse 10. The commandment which was ordained to life. Here's the thing. 
the command was ordained to life. It always was about life. That was its intention. Why? Because of the life was its source. This life, here's the thing. We could say that the body that cast the shadow was the pledge from the very beginning. Why? Because that substance, that body, is the only substance that could fill up the form that was cast. Only one. Nobody can fill up the shadow that you cast, but you. Only the substance that casts it can be the culmination of it. So that's why he was the pledge. He was standing there as the guarantee of it. Proverbs would say it. Before all of this was, I stood there as his delight. When he said to the oceans this far, no further. I was there. I stood there as his delight. That delight is the substance that he's crying out for, is the guarantee of it all, because he is the author and finisher, the beginning and the end. He comes as the substance of the volume of the book. So the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. What does that mean? It means that the sin that was in me looked at the commandments. Looked at the law that testified of this. But me reading the law, the sin, the law of sin and death that's in my members looked at that and said, you can do it. Just apply it better, do it better, do it more often, whatever. You can do this. And guess what? It was deception. This is truth. This is deception. This vessel believing it can do that. It can fulfill it. And what happened to him? The law that was testifying of this life looked at this vessel and condemned it as dead. That was, that's what it means. It, it slew me. It exposed the death that's in me. Why? Because I was not the guarantee of it. I was not the surety. I wasn't the thing that made it so. He is. Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Meaning, is the law, the thing that's good, the means of that death? No. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Meaning, the law showed me how sinful this sin really is. How huge... <laughs> Of a, I don't know, couldn't say pit or whatever, but how exceedingly sinful this condition really is. It wasn't just, ah, do some bad stuff. See, that's why we can have those testimony services of people coming to church and saying, man, I was a drug addict, but God saved me. And we're like, oh, oh man, that's amazing. How about I was born? In sin, guess what? One's the same. It's all the same. Born in sin and death is the extent. That's the exceeding sinfulness. It wasn't just this guy was really bad, this guy wasn't so bad. No, all fall short. None righteous. And that's what the law showed, the exceeding sinfulness of man under the headship and rule of Adam. Verse 14, for we know the law is spiritual. He just said the law is good and holy. Now he says spiritual. And that's just a synonym for good. I am carnal, sold under sin. I am the slave, sold under sin. The law is spiritual. I am carnal. That's two opposing things. 
The law testified of one, desired one, required one, and it exposed the other to be the very antithesis of the other. But in the midst of it all, it's promising the guarantee's coming. The surety's coming. Man who depends on himself to be that lives in that frustration forever. But those who would receive the good thing, who would receive the guarantee, now not just an eternal guarantee of the, of the law's commands, but now by faith receive the internal guarantee of what the law demanded, of what God requires. God still requires perfection. That hadn't changed. That's what freaks people out. That's what freaks people out. That's why we read Matthew 5 and we go, oh my God, not only can I not do it, I can't even think it. And so we say, man, I can't do that. Exactly. Correct. But he is that. See? That's the whole point of this. Be for me what I can't be. That's the cry of the psalmist under the law. That's the reality of the soul in Christ. That is truth and life for the believer who has by faith received the guarantee of the new covenant. The surety of it. The man standing in the holiest of all for us in the sight of God anchoring for us in the sight of God our soul's perfect, untouchable state of being. That's good news. That's good news. I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law, it is good. Why? Because it's exposing me as not good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. There's the source of it. Sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present. I have the will. I have the desire. But there's no ability to perform it. There's no power to actually bring it about. Why? Because it's not in me. I have nothing of that in me. He's talking again as a man under the law. So what does he say? Come. Who will deliver me? Save me. Who will deliver me from this death that keeps this torment going over and over again? There's no deliverance here. And we know the coming of the good. The coming of Christ. The guarantee power, the law of life came and did what? Fulfilled in me the righteousness of the law. No longer demanding from me the righteousness I cannot perform. I can't do it. He is it in me. Simple. But this is the struggle most believers still have. They think this is their condition, crying out for God to save them from this death and this sin and this corruption. No, he now lives in you. If you're born again, if Christ is in you, he now lives in you, not as a promise of the good that's coming, but he lives in you as the guarantee. Because he is in you the good that has come. He's in you everything God promised, all of the righteousness God ever required I, I was going to say of man, he never required it of man, but everything God demanded, every righteous requirement God had, Christ is in the soul. 
And the presence of Christ in the soul is the guaranteeing power that righteousness is perfectly kept, perfect in its substance and form. We have not just the testimony now, we have righteousness in its most perfect form in that spirit. The law of the spirit of life. Why? Do you see the pitiable state of a man trying to be the guarantee of his own soul? The guarantee of his own condition and standing before God? Can you see that pitiful state? There's nothing good in me. Nothing. This is not Paul isolated away from everybody else. This is all men. This is this psalmist understanding unless you are the pledge for this good to be in me, it'll never be there. It will never be so. You must be the pledge. You must be the surety and the guarantee of it all for me. This is why Paul would call Christ the end of the law for righteousness in Romans 3. And he leads us to that declaration of Christ as the end of the law for righteousness. That's important. Not just the end of the law. The end of the law for righteousness. That righteousness or the good or the life can finally be the soul's possession. He comes. As the end of it. As the culmination of it. And he gets to that point by first describing the utter corruption, death, sinfulness of all men, not just Jew, not just Gentile, but all. Those the law condemned to be under sin. So the end of the law had to come, meaning the end point, the culmination that does not fall short of its intention must come and make himself fully accessible To all who will believe upon him. Who will receive him. That he would be the imputed accomplishment of righteousness. A righteousness that the law not only demanded. But that the law had surety of. Eternally. God didn't take his eyes off of Jesus and look at man during the whole of this age. He never did that. He didn't take his eyes off of Christ and now says, now, you do it. No. That's why the law, the whole of that age was a testimony of this, not this. It was never a picture of how perfect this could become. It was a picture of the perfection of one perfect man the pledge the guarantee the sureness of it all and so the need for God to provide the guaranteeing power doesn't change when we come from the old to the new from the law to faith it just now becomes an internal power power that actually has affected the soul and made the soul a partaker of the good thing. The the good thing that is now in you, Paul would say. It's no longer the shadow of the thing to come. Now the thing that was to come that that was a shadow of has come. And he is in us the guarantee, the surety of it. And this is what uh, Romans or not Romans, Hebrews Chapter 7, verse 18 says, verse 18 through 25, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. This was the hope of always the hope. This was the hope. This was the expectation the law set forth. Never had any reference point here. Always here. ( 
the better hope did, the which, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made the surety, the guarantee. The word surety there means the guarantee of a reality. One who guarantees the reality of something. That's from the Thayer's lexicon. One who guarantees the reality of something. By so much was Jesus made the one who guarantees the reality of the better covenant. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue because they died. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him. I like that. Save them to the uttermost. You know, that, that means fully, completely. That means it's sure. Never to change. Why? Because this priest never dies. His priesthood is unchangeable. That's not certainty. There is none. So he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God through him, seeing that he ever lives, making intercession for them. His intercession in my soul, the one who stands in the sight of God, affirming a finished work, a f- affirming God's delight has finally been fulfilled. His pleasure has been brought to pass. His intention is now culminated. That one standing there anchoring that reality in heaven itself lives in us and anchors the soul he lives in, in the good of that perfect reality, in the good of that condition because he is the surety of the new covenant the new covenant that is in our heart not on tablets of stone no wonder he will write in this following verse my eyes long for your salvation again as a man of the law my eyes long for your salvation He said that previously in in verse 82 of Psalms 119, basically using the same phrase. He says, my eyes fail me for your word. Doesn't mean I read the Bible and my eyes get tired. (coughs) My eyes fail me for your word. When will you comfort me? We know when the comforter comes. We know the comforting of Israel came when Simeon seized the Messiah as an eight-day-old child. Because he was waiting on the comforting or consolation of Israel. Psalmist, verse 82 of Psalms 119 is saying, My eyes fail me (coughs) for your word. Meaning, same thing here, someone looking afar off for a long period of time until their eyes become so weary. They can't hold them open anymore. And then they finally, at the moment of exhaustion, see the silhouette of whatever they're waiting for. And that's what he's saying here. I long, my eyes fail me for your comfort. When will you comfort me? Well, that's what he's crying out for, the comforting of the guarantee of it all, the guarantee of the good that God promised under the law to finally come and live and be his guarantee. Because the verse 83 of that, he says, I am like a bottle in the smoke. It's a bottle made out of skin that would hang in the tents and the smoke would come up from the fires and would blacken and dry out the skins that were meant to hold liquid (coughs) and just crackle it up and make it dry and lifeless and it was just ugly and and he says that's me like a dried up piece of skin 
when will you come and comfort me? When will you come and give me the salvation I long for? This is what he's waiting on. This is what he's praying for, that the guarantee of the good will finally come and be God's comforting, God's extending of mercy to his soul. And again, that's a man under the law praying that prayer. What I want us to understand is that our salvation is this man's prayer fulfilled. That's, that's the beauty of it. We don't have, we're not crying out as those missing anything, as those waiting for something yet to be. We are those who have in us, through the grace, mercy, and comforting of God, everything that God pledged, everything God promised. Nothing's missing. And that's why for those of us who have come into whom he's come, in whom he lives, we shouldn't be praying for a guarantee. We shouldn't be looking for ourselves to be the surety of anything. We should pray for God to open our eyes. To see the guaranteeing power and presence of Christ. So that we may live in the certainty of the surety. The acknowledgement of the good that has come. And we'll never again seek to find that guarantee in ourselves. But rejoice for the good thing that's in us. So we'll stop there, guys. Thanks for uh, listening.